It is a bitter, bitter cold day out in the Rockies, but I'm loving it. I know the day is almost over already. That's about how soon I got out of bed this morning. Ah, just some days, you know, just makes more sense getting that extra shut eye than it does having your fingers fall off trying to get something done outside. But you gotta do what you gotta do, so the water light is on again, of course, in the winter time, even though we're using like a fraction of the amount of water. And that means that me being the water boy, gotta go down to town and get some, uh, you know, a couple, three, four hundred gallons of uh, water. Which also means uh, I had to start up this uh, truck. I wanted to make sure I didn't leave it plugged in. That'd be a bad. That's something like I would do, right? Leave the truck plugged in. Just a sec. Well, I don't see any extension cord hanging from the end of the truck, so. If I did leave it plugged in, then hopefully the extension cord isn't halfway down the, the road somewhere. But if it is, oh well. That's like a $10 loss, maybe. Oh man, I've been so scatterbrained lately. I tell you, I tell you guys, uh, the more of this uh, insane world you try to process in your brain, you know, minus a uh, Near a link. Brain jack. Uh, it's it's just it's hard and harder to, to keep track of like the basic necessities of life. The day to day, you know what I'm saying? And there's a lot of little details in the day that you gotta keep track of, that you gotta keep up on, or you just start slipping. You know what I mean? You just start slipping start getting sloppy start looking a little bit like a slob not a slob but a slob and then you know shortly after you become a slab uh, yeah I gotta storm my way on down the mountain the kitties need food yes we have like seven ravenous lions to feed um, let, me, let, me, let me let me let me count. Let me count. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six now. Minus the uh, patriarch, the alpha cat, the coolest cat that ever lived, Sir Tynos. We really miss that guy, but it was his time, you know. He still had a, a huge heart. That was the last thing that he ended up asphyxiating on his own vomit. And I just so happened to be there when it happened. And I felt kind of helpless. I couldn't really do much for him. You know, I wasn't like trained in cat CPR, but I don't think that would have really helped anyway because he had, he couldn't get it. Yeah, I don't know. I always second guess myself. He couldn't get enough air back in after he, I think, vomited and tried to inhale his own vomits, and it's just a bad situation. Thankfully, thank God, is you know merciful, and it didn't last very long. You know, you can only go. What is it now? Like uh, two minutes, just under, without passing out. And I think it's like maybe what is it? 
correct me if I'm wrong, I might have to look this up afterwards, but I think it's like maybe two and a half, three minutes until you're uh, basically brain dead, your brain starves of oxygen. Anyway, why I got into that is because the last thing, the last sign of life that was left in the little guy was his heart, his strong heart. Still beating, even though he wasn't breathing. His eyes were dilated. Anyway, sad story aside, uh, you know, that's life. Like, life is, you know, we live in this paradox between life and death. And, and we like to hide that ugly little detail that from our day-to-day -day existence that, you know what, our time is short and uh, pretty soon here, not too long, we're going to have to face death, whether it's, you know, our loved ones, our friends, or ourselves, you know, on our own uh, deathbed. And if you don't have any faith in anything greater than this life, right, and the things of this world, you know, the corporate gadgets, trinkets, consumer goods, you know, mindless entertainments, uh, fantasy worlds lived out on the big screen, uh, status, I mean, you can name it. Name your alternative, right? If, if you don't have anything, uh, belief in anything greater than what we see in this world, then that's a pretty, that's a pretty, uh, dark tunnel to look down and step into to that threshold of uh, just uncertainty, unknowing you know you know ever since I was a kid I just common sense I never believed in the uh, and yes it is kind of a pagan concept that you have this eternal soul that goes on after you die. No, because uh, that would have made the devil uh, the truth teller and God the liar when he said, as soon as you eat of that tree in the garden, ye shall surely die. Um, if we had an immortal soul, we wouldn't need a savior, right? That promises us eternal life if we already go on living. If that makes any sense? Which also does away with the whole uh, papal pagan concept of uh, eternally burning hell you know being a place that you go when you die because you got to do something with his eternal soul right you can't just reward it with eternal life right so you got to have a place where God the sadist just tortures people on and on and on forever and all these like if you look into Dante's Inferno that fictionary account a fictional account. Um, <laughs> think of the mindset that it takes, and that's and that's like the epitome of what it looks like when people are, are ruled by the uh, satanic seat of Satan. During the Dark Ages, when the papal system ruled over the minds, you know, and the politics, just about every aspect of. Um, the affairs of men and women. Uh, let's think of the twisted mindset of a guy who writes something like Dante's Inferno, just in envisioning every uh, wicked you know, vice of man and uh, sin that our fallen natures can think up. And thinking of a adequate punishment, right, for all those sins. You see people, like, getting sawed in half from the groin up and lots of sexual deviancy, of course. Which is, obviously, like I said, human nature hasn't changed any. Uh, especially when you put people in an unnatural situation, like uh, a male priesthood that can't marry a man it's not a, it is not good that man should be alone, right? It says in Genesis. So Eve was created as a companion and a helper for man. That's the classical biblical account. And you have this pagan priesthood in the Vatican that you know tells all of its uh, 
fathers, you know, you're not supposed to call any man father, but they call their men father. And you're not supposed to confess any sin to a man because that is blasphemy, according to the Bible. That's in fact what they almost stoned Jesus for, even though it was a little different in his case because he was actually God become man, the flesh, the son of man. Uh, so you have a system that deprives men of the natural tendency to want to be with a woman, right? And on some level, you know, sexually gratified, right? So what do you get? You get a bunch of pedophile priests. I don't know, but I don't know if anybody heard this story recently, but there's a yet another big, big time event. Uh, can't speak. My lips are halfway frozen. Big time investigation. Still trying to get warmed up. Haven't got the heater on yet. And it's like, I don't have a thermostat in here, but it's freaking cold today. My hands, my little fingers are falling off. Like I said, I wouldn't let them. Yes, but I gotta hold this camera still. I don't have any kind of a mount. A friend of mine said I should get a dash mount. It might work, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, yeah, I think it was in, uh, is it in Baltimore? Yeah, the diocese in Baltimore, I think it is. I'll stick it up if I uh, find the article later. And the judge is trying to make everything hush-hush so that none of these little unseemly details get out to the public. And again, you see this endless, just perpetual pedo syndicate, which is the, uh, the Vatican. And it's just this continual modus operandi of cover up, cover up, you know, take, a, take tithe from the church members and pay off large bribes to a lot of these people so they like hush money right they stay quiet and it's 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 really falling apart at the seams I think you know it's getting to a point that this wicked corpse of an antichrist system it's just so obvious that they can't hide it anymore you know it's just as evil and rotten as it gets and eventually it says in the book of Revelation that that city on seven hills that the Protestant reformers identified as Scarlet Harlot, right? The false church, the unfaithful church, the one who's drunken with the world, the one who gets in bed with all the kings, the merchants of the world. One day, I don't think before too long, that city is going to burn and that will be God's judgment. How that goes about? I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Is that a direct act from God? Is that like an act of retaliation from all of these atrocities coming out of that evil, wicked system? Not 100% sure on that. In any case, it is God's will that she and all of her sins be exposed. Because that last message to the world, the first, the second, and the third angel's messages, Come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon. She has fallen. Be not a partaker in her sins. You know, her sins reach up to heaven. You know, otherwise, you will receive the plagues. And the only the best way to come out of Babylon is to have your mind, to have your character formed in the image, in the character of Christ, his son, the highest principle, the highest standard that man can ever attain to, the, the greatest example of mankind that God has ever produced in mankind, being the Messiah, who, by the way, out of all the people throughout history, has had more of an influence on the entire world, having never written down a word himself. His followers were so on fire that they were willing to face the Roman Colosseums with wild beasts being torn apart by lions, you know, killed as an amusement for the Roman populace. They so believed that Jesus was the Messiah, that he did rise from the grave, and that their faith was not in vain. They would not sprinkle a little tiny bit of incense to Caesar. So strong was their faith and their conviction and their loyalty. Now, if you look at the Christian world today, you know, we're starting to look a lot 
more like the Daughters of the Harlot than the, uh, you know, chaste, pure virgin of the uh, Bride of Christ. An historic service at the Washington National Cathedral. For the first time, an openly transgender priest spoke from the pulpit. Fox's Lauren DeMarco has the details. Officials here at the National Cathedral say that they're hoping to send a message of love and affirmation to the LGBT community. They're celebrating equality in honor of Pride Month. At this point, I was known as an openly gay partnered woman, and I was just beginning to come to terms with being trans. Not words you would typically expect to hear from the pulpit. Reverend Gene Robinson, widely known for becoming the first openly gay Christian priest to be elected bishop, presided at the service. Uh, in a sense, the cathedral has come out uh, to the world in, in new and bold ways, and I am so grateful to you. Ceremonies steeped in tradition, carried out within a historic location with a new air of acceptance. Partridge preached from the very spot from where Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his final sermon. Yeah, the, the uh, cover-up going on in uh, Baltimore, I think it is. Uh, this is just an ongoing problem with that institution. And if you can imagine any other religious sect getting away with this institutionalized child abuse, not only that, but like we saw in Canada recently with some of the natives, the schools, right, the indoctrination centers, you know, nobody was better at that than the, uh, the Vatican. Uh, literal deaths, like mass burials of children. Just to imagine any other sect, any other religion, any other cult, which is basically it is, the biggest cult in the world when you have a, a leader declaring to take the place of God on earth. Uh, the head of the church you know, who claims the throne of Saint Peter, right? If you have any other sect or cult, any other sect of Chris Christianity that would have a leader at its head that would claim to take on the prerogatives of God would be seen as a cult, but not the uh, papacy, right? Uh, but if you had any other religious sect out there with all this dirt, all this blood, all this institutionalized abuse and cover-up and protecting its own, right, over the, uh, you know, they're so concerned with the poor and the, and the you know, the, the little kids. The Pope loves the little kids, right? Yeah, I bet. I bet you love the little kids there, Pope Francis, and so did your uh, sick uh, Nazi youth, Pope Benedict predecessor, which did the same thing, covered up pet, you know, child abuse in the Vatican. These people are sick, and it's, and it's, and it's, uh, there's a reason why it's, you know, God so hates the seed of Antichrist, which is what it is, which is what has been known for over, what was it recently, the 500th year uh, celebration of the Reformation, where, uh, Martin Luther tacked the thesis onto the door of the cathedral there. And unfortunately what's happened with the daughters of the church, with the daughters of the harlot, is that they've all come back to their mama and they've all apologized for the sins of their founders, of their, uh, those Protestants that, you know, found out from the scripture who the true identity of Antichrist really was. Now you can read Calvin, Knox, Luther. Um, you can read all their quotes about unabashedly who they believe is the true Antichrist. And yet the world today is so confused, right? Nobody seems to know who the Antichrist is. They're all looking for a future you know, like a businessman who's atheist and, uh, yeah, he's wearing a three-piece suit and, uh, no, 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 no. 
The whole idea of a coming future Antichrist was a Jesuit conception in the first place. Literally pinned by a Jesuit. Futurism. To take everybody's eyes off of the Vatican, off of the true seat of Antichrist, to look to a future Antichrist, right? And they've been pretty successful when you have the majority of the Christian world buying into this belief to this day. Ten oasis regions where each delegate is given complete control over his respective area. True global community, a true world of peace. This marks the beginning of our seven years of peace, of seven years. This marks the beginning of the rise of the Antichrist. He will control ten kingdoms, which in turn will control the world. The Antichrist will sit in the temple of God and he will declare to the whole world that he is God. It couldn't be something simple, right? No. It couldn't be the same institution, the oldest institution on the earth. From its inception, the Holy See in about 330 AD, from its inception, trying to push for a new world order, globalism. Having survived all of that time, to this day, still pushing for more globalism, for a world order, and pompously, that blasphemous little horn power in Daniel. Who else do you think the Vatican wants to put you know, at the head of this new world order? Of course, right? We need a new financial system, right? That's why you have the Vatican and the Rothschilds getting in bed to redefine the economy of the world in this push for inclusive capitalism. If you know any history of the Rothschilds, they were the, uh, yes, Jewish banking cartel who bailed out the Vatican after Berthier and uh, Napoleon captured the Pope, took away its statehood, took away its um, political power, temporal power. Guess who got it back in power? The Rothschilds. Way, 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 way back when. And it's still these these dynasties, these these um, inbred, this intergenerational wealth. Um, and at the very top of this dung pile, this bloated corpse, literally as they do, most of their cathedrals built upon graveyards. Uh, you know, their basements filled with skeletons, death, Oh, not to mention that, but also torture chambers. The most sickening, disgusting, wicked, twisted uh, inventions to inflict the most amount of pain on an individual to get people to recant. Because, you know, how hard is it to uh, force people to say whatever you want them to say when they're just trying to... Stop the pain. If you really want a morbid read, then read the uh, Fox's Book of Mortars sometimes. Fox's Book of Martyrs. So, in any case, you got these same powers, the same interests, uh, influencing governments of the world today. But everybody's blind to the uh, true nature true identity, a true location of the Antichrist. There is a great darkness on this earth. Great, great darkness. And all I'm saying is, you know, if you're interested in this topic, 
please read some of the writings, some of the early writings of these uh, reformers who, identi who identified the papacy as the Antichrist. Read your Bible with an open mind. Uh, realize that the scripture is there to interpret itself. Okay, you know, there's a lot of talk about the uh, mark of the beast, you know, and as I call it, beast tech. You know, you have to have some kind of technology to enforce the no buy, no sell. That doesn't make it that, doesn't make it necessary for a chip to actually have to be implanted into your hand to receive the mark of the beast. No, that's actually kind of superimposing your own uh, contemporary worldview on the scripture. If you read the scripture itself, and I'll give you one little homework assignment. If you, if you don't already know this, you know, I'm, I'm not assuming people listening to me out there aren't intelligent. I'm just assuming that what I've seen from a lot of other people that a lot of people are ignorant on this topic. If you let the Bible interpret itself, you know, go over to Deuteronomy 8 and read the first instance of when this concept of a mark in the right hand, or as it calls it, a frontlet between your eyes, right? Your temple, your, your temporal lobes, your frontal lobe, which is ultimately, yes, your temple where God resides, where God communicates to his people. The thing that separates us from the animal kingdom the ability to reason and know right from wrong and make a choice, right? You, know, you, know, you don't, I talked about my cat, Tynos. You don't, you don't put your kitty, he was an avid hunter. He sure loved to kill those little voles and mice. You don't put him on trial, you know, for murder, right? Because a cat does what a cat is programmed to do and he can do no other, right? A, can, a cat cannot make a moral choice. Now you can try to, you know, swat him on the head every time he goes after a mouse, and he might out of fear, right? Which re reminds me a lot of the uh, papal system as well, as any false religion. Goes an ambulance. As any false religion, uh, it uses fear. Hence Dante's Inferno. Hence the uh, the passion plays. You know, you know, the, the uh, Vatican was master of monopolizing the arts, right, including theater, during the medieval ages. And so it would scare the hell out of people. It, you know, it's, it's one theory is that a lot of these uh, accounts of monsters in the woods, werewolves, vampires, a lot of that was... Uh, Kind of like we have today, right? With these pandemics, and these wars and rumors of wars. It's this constant perpetual state of fear, which is mind control. Because if you're under fear and duress continually, you don't think straight. You start to lose your reasoning capacity. You know, you start to act irrational and react and reach out to your, your highest authority meaning the federal government, to solve all your problems and take away all your fears and keep you safe from all these imaginary threats out in the world. It's a big, scary, dark, evil world. So the, the, the papacy was master of this as well. Whipping up fear and hysteria, you know, witch hunts, right? Inquisitions, right? Where this literal psychological effect uh, would take over and this was even the the, uh, you know, the daughters of the harlot in the New World, with the uh, Salem witch, tri witch trials and whatnot. I'm gonna make sure I get my turn here. I don't want to miss my turn. Okay, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. Yep. Uh, yeah, with the uh, so-called Protestants, the. Uh, Puritans that moved to this country, they just started to reenact a lot of the same insanity as their mother church did back in old Europe that we supposedly tried to run away from, right? 
And we have a lot of people in this modern day and age that are calling for another return to religion in politics. Now, don't get me wrong, I do believe in religious people, you know, people that are moved by the Holy Spirit, that have the character that has been shaped by, you know, the, the story of Christ. Um, I'm all for Holy Spirit inspired leaders and, and positions of governments and politics, but I am not for, one thing I am not for, is for the, uh, the state to take on the role of pushing religion, any religion, right? You know, we're all worried about Sharia law. What about, uh, you know, what about a uh, same kind of thing with a Christian flavor? Yeah, we kind of had that during the Dark Ages, didn't we? In old Europe. And that's why we have the First Amendment. That's why it's there. Contrary to some popular, you know, Republican talking heads lately. Yes, we should have separation of church and state. Very important. Where did I, where did I start and how did I get here? That's always what I wonder at the end of these shows, don't you? I wonder if anybody else has that same impression. How did we get here? Anyway, my philosophy is, like it says, when you're brought in front of the magistrates, when you're brought in front of the uh, YouTube audience, think not what you will say, for I will give you the words which to say. Something like that is how it goes. Anyway, enough pontificating. I uh, hope all that made sense. Uh, Appreciate all you guys. I'm trying not to run into cars. That's why I'm not paying much attention right now. Uh, this, I got a big old trailer on the back end of my truck here. I'm just driving around aimlessly through the parking lot. I don't know why. That's, just looking for that perfect spot. You know what I'm, look, you know what I'm, what I'm talking about? Anyway, um, this will work, I think. Anyway, God bless everybody. This is Nightwatch Nate. I hope some of that made sense. Sorry, I got kind of dark there. I don't have a light on top of this thing yet. I should probably get one. Although, it, maybe I shouldn't, because I'd probably just make this thing more distracting while I'm driving down the road. I hope all that made sense. If you have any questions on where I arrived at, what I arrived at, let me know. But yeah, as, as I said, if you're looking for... Um, if you're looking for um, to identify some of the symbols and the characters in, in scripture, like the mark in the right hand or the frontlet between your eyes, do a little Bible search. That's what I used to do. That's what I should do more often. But when I was first stumbling on some of these truths in the scripture, as like the identity of the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and all that, all you gotta do is, is do an exact word match and a phrase look it up in the Bible and uh, let the Bible interpret itself you know what does the Bible say about this topic and as I pointed y'all to the uh, first um, that I could find maybe you can find another example but the first example I could find of in the right hand or in the forehead are those uh, passages in Deuteronomy 6 8 talking about the law of God and if you look at all the different you know, stories throughout the Old Testament and the New. Uh, usually the, the prophets of God are killed by the kings, the wicked kings, because they wouldn't go along with the king over and above remaining faithful to God's commandments. And I believe the same history will be repeated during the short-lived uh, power grab the kings of the earth will wage war on God's people and force, enforce false worship. Right? Revelations 13, 15. Anyway, I gotta get going. I gotta use the bathroom. It's been a long drive. Uh, God bless everybody. This is Nightwatch Nate. Let me know what you think in the comments section if you can. Thanks for watching. God bless. Signing out.
up to 